In this video, we're going to introduce the concept of reduce mass. Now, if you've spent any time in physics uh, classes and programs, then you probably already have an understanding or at least a definition, a general definition of reduced mass. But I want to make sure that at this level, when we're studying physical chemistry, that we have a little bit more of a sophisticated definition of reduced mass. So I want to kind of give a, a general introduction to not just reduced mass, but its, uh, its effects on the equation of motion and kind of where it comes from and why it's useful. Because a deep understanding of this is going to be useful, especially when we start talking about molecular diatomics. We use this concept of reduced mass a lot. Uh, we talk about the spectroscopy of diatomics. So it's going to be a useful thing to make sure that you have. So um, in general, we're going to be looking at a similar physical problem that we introduced last time, a vibrational motion between two particles that are attached by this spring force, right? So we got mass one at position X one, and you got mass two at position X two. So importantly, you know, the, the first initial thing to think of is, okay, well, what if I just consider an equation of motion for each one of these? And the answer to that is that that's a good place to start, but um, that those equations of motion will be coupled because since they're attached by this using this spring, those equations of motion will be coupled to one another. The position of M1 will be dependent on the position of M2 and vice versa. So we end up with two uh, coupled equations of motion. So we have two coupled equations. And so the first one for mass one, you'll have mass one and you'll have the second derivative of the position X1 dt it's going to be equal to the spring constant and you'll have x2 minus x1 minus the equilibrium length right so that l naught is going to be our equilibrium length right so just like we introduced in the last video it's the current length minus the equilibrium length so to get your current length of the oscillator, you just take X2 minus X1, and then L0 is just going to be your equilibrium length. Now, the second uh, equation of motion is going to be related, right? So you got M2, second derivative of X2, equal to negative KF, X2 minus X1 minus the equilibrium length again. Right. So basically what I want to point out here, I want to point out two things. Right. First, um, you got to have the opposite sign here. Right. These, the motion of one is going to affect the other one in, in the opposite direction. Right. So we have this um, or the force is going to be applied in the opposite direction. Right. So uh, so we have this negative sign to account for that. But also these equations are coupled because X1 does not just depend on its equation of motion does not just depend on X1. Right. It depends on the position of mass two as well x2 same thing for mass two mass two's position does not just depend on x2 i mean yeah it does not just depend on x2 it also depends on x1 right so uh so that's why these equations are coupled right now if we just isolate the derivatives here so i'm just going to do algebra here to isolate the derivatives so we're going to isolate the derivatives Then we end up with um, just doing the simple algebra here. So we got dx, uh, the second derivative of x is going to be equal to kf over m1, x2 minus x1 minus l naught. And then for the second equation, we've got second derivative of x squared dt negative kf over m2 x2 minus x1 minus l naught right so we've got these two uh, so we've got these two equations right we've isolated the derivatives in both cases and to couple these equations together what i'm going to do is just subtract these to uh to kind of get an explicit relationship between the two so we're going to subtract both We'll just say subtract them from one from the other, right? So we're gonna what we're gonna do is have uh, dx the second derivative of x two minus the second derivative 
of x1 and i should give myself a little bit more space here so second derivative of x2 minus second derivative of x1 right so that's going to be equal to I have negative kf over m2 x2 minus x1 minus l naught minus uh kf over m1 x2 minus x1 minus l naught okay so uh so basically what we have here right so kind of want to point out here that this uh, coordinate here is really a relative coordinate. Right, it's a relative coordinate uh, because it relates x2 to x1 and this equilibrium position. So it's really a, a relative coordinate. So what I want to do is do some algebra here to isolate that relative coordinate. So you end up with negative kf and you'll have 1 over m1 plus 1 over m2 x2 minus x1 minus l naught right so we got still on the left hand side we've got these derivatives here right so um so basically we have this relative coordinate and now we need some kind of way to have a relative mass, right? And that's what this term is, right? Believe it or not, this is actually um, the definition of the inverse of the, uh, the reduced mass. But right now, I'll just call this our relative mass term, right? So we have a relative coordinate. We need a relative mass. So let's make this a little bit more explicit. So let's define the reduced mass actually show the algebra here so algebraically right you end up with you know 1 over m1 plus 1 over m2 right that's just equal to you know if you um use common denominators here you got m1 plus m2 times m1 times m2 Right. This is just the inverse of the reduced mass, which we use the Greek letter small mu to denote the reduced mass. So mu here is the reduced mass. Reduced mass. So now that we've got the reduced mass here, right now we can actually re-express this uh, this equation of motion as coupled equation uh, in terms of the reduced mass. So we're going to re-express this guy. So re-express in terms of the reduced mass, and also we're going to re-express our relative coordinate. So this relative coordinate, this x one minus x two. Any, anything related to displacement, we're just going to call X. And so by doing that, we have second derivative of X is going to be equal to negative KF times one over mu times X, right? So all we've done here is just, uh, just all of the relative coordinates are now being called x. And so what does this give us here? Well, if we rearrange the algebra a little bit, then we have the following. We have mu is equal to the second derivative of x, right, plus kfx. And this looks exactly like our simple harmonic motion equation, right? This is what we would call an effective one body equation an effective one body equation right we took what was a two body problem by body i just mean object or particle right this is kind of synonymous right we started with a two body problem mass one mass two and what we're able to do and the real power of the reduced mass and this is what i mean by having a more sophisticated understanding of what the reduced mass is doing it's not that it's just a you know average mass or whatever um it is really allowing us to express a two-body problem 
in terms of an effective one body problem because we only have one mass that being the reduced mass of the oscillator rather than mass one and mass two right so we have all of this uh all of this stuff is relative to a single oscillator rather than a two body problem okay so that's enough with classical mechanics so in the next video we're going to use this knowledge that we have of, of the classical understanding of an oscillator in order to discuss the uh the quantum harmonic oscillator its energy levels its hamiltonian its wave function and its properties